My best friend's Nana was always the warm and bright spirit in the room. She delighted in her family and was always teaching her granddaughters about how much of this or that belonged in the cookies they'd bake each year for the holidays for neighbors and friends. But a few years ago, it was her granddaughters who started having to remind Nana about the spices in the cookie recipe. Her memory was fading. And eventually, Nana was placed under the care of a day nurse. One day, I received a panicked phone call from my friend. Nana was missing. She had managed to get out of the house in between the transition of her nurse leaving and a family member coming to check on her. I was back home in Seattle for the summer, and my friend wanted to know if I could help search for her. It was the middle of the workday, but I said, of course, and raced over. Luckily, I found her pretty quickly in the neighborhood. She was out for a walk, wearing a hat, gloves, and a coat despite the heat. I could see that she was unharmed, though perhaps overdressed. I felt so relieved, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She just flashed me that warm smile and asked me how much I liked the trees. She didn't remember me or that she wasn't supposed to go outside unattended. Soon after, my best friend's family had to get wraparound care for Nana. She'd forgotten who she was and who others were. She stopped being able to communicate with those around her and eventually was no longer able to speak. But that doesn't mean she doesn't have thoughts or doesn't want to communicate with her family. I think about how it must feel for her to be so isolated in that way. And I see how devastating it is for my friend to lose touch with this relationship. What would it have meant for this last decade if Nana could have shared? I'm Sherelle Dorsey, and this is TED Tech. Millions of people around the world ask themselves a version of that question after they or a loved one loses their ability to communicate due to illness or injury. Today, we'll be hearing from Tom Oxley, a neural tech entrepreneur whose research into assistive technology for neurological disorders may offer some answers. He'll be discussing how a new technology his team has been working on could restore the ability to communicate through a brain implant that turns thoughts into text. A few months ago, I surrendered the password to my Twitter account to let a person with paralysis tweet out their thoughts. But I mean that literally. Philip O'Keefe can't use his fingers to type like you or I, but thanks to a tiny brain implant, he was able to send the following tweets. Hello, world. Short tweet. Monumental progress. No need for keystrokes or voices. I created this tweet just by thinking it. My hope is that I pave the way for people to be able to tweet through thoughts. Phil. Now, you might be thinking there are some people out there who should not be allowed to tweet directly from their brain. <laughs> I agree. But for people with paralysis and disability, this technology can be life-changing. I'm very excited to introduce you to Philip and Rodney. They both have a neurodegenerative disease called ALS, means they can't move their hands or speak clearly. But they can now text thanks to a brain-computer interface, or BCI. They will fill up brain signals up on the screen. They're connected to their computers via Bluetooth. The device is fully internalized, invisible to the outside world. And they learn to control the keyboard with clicks directly coming from their brain. Now, BCIs conjure up images of science fiction like The Matrix, with a cable jacked up into your brain through a hole in your skull. But I'm here to show you that the future can be much more elegant than that. So we got this group chat going, which I thought was a great idea until they started roasting me about the TED Talk, <laughs> which they found hilarious. Thanks for the vote of confidence, guys. Bloody Australians. <laughs> Now, you can see it's still quite slow for them to type this way, but This is like dial-up speeds at the beginning of the internet. This has been the dream of patients and caregivers, doctors and scientists for decades, and for good reason. 
You may know someone who's lost the ability to use their hands, maybe from a stroke or a spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis, paralysis. It comes in all shapes and sizes, from minor inconvenience to life-threatening. During my neurology residency, I cared for a man in his 40s. He had a stroke and developed locked-in syndrome. Many couldn't move his body except for his eyes, left or right. He could see and hear and think and feel just like normal, but he couldn't move or speak ever again. And in what were horrific circumstances, we supported his wish to be taken off life support. And so I've been wondering ever since: was there not anything else that could have been done? Connection. Is a fundamental human need. So many of our patients have lost the ability to speak, let alone type, for years, and they so desperately want to reconnect with their family, with their loved ones. You know what the main request we get is: text messaging, and then email, control over their smartphone, and shock horror, social media. We've been speaking so much lately about the. Flaws of these technologies, but for people with paralysis, this is a return to life. The BCIs make all of this possible. Now, part of the problem has been that BCIs typically require invasive surgery. This is the Utah array. This is designed similarly to all other BCIs currently under development, which require drilling needles directly into the brain. Now, this has been the basis of critical, fundamental research over the last 20 years. And the early proof that this technology really can perform, but for patients it means open brain surgery, which involves cutting through the skull with a saw. And there are only about 150 functional neurosurgeons in the U.S. that can perform this procedure. Apart from the fact that the recovery is tricky, the brain doesn't really like having needles put into it. It develops this foreign body tissue rejection immune reaction over time. So I've been wondering. Is there any other way into the brain? And there is a secret back door. The blood vessels are the natural highways into the brain. These are hollow tubes that connect every corner of the brain. The largest vein is right next to the motor cortex, the exact part of the brain that we want to connect to to restore control to the outside world. Now. We already know how to travel through the blood vessels. We've been doing it for 40 years, mostly going to the heart. If anyone here today has had a heart attack, there's a pretty good chance you've had a stent. A stent is a metal scaffold delivered through a catheter, which opens up like a flower into the blood vessel. Millions of stents are delivered each year, not in the OR, but in the cath lab or catheter laboratory. It's now common in the cath lab to navigate up into the brain through the blood vessels, and there are two and a half thousand physicians who can now navigate their way up into the brain. But what's really amazing about this is that for BCIs, we already know that devices can be left inside a blood vessel, cells grow over it, incorporated into the wall like a tattoo under the skin, and we're protected from that immune reaction. This is part of the reason why our team. Became the first in the world to receive a green light from the FDA to conduct clinical trials of a permanently implanted BCI. So what we had to do was figure out a way to put a sensor connected to the cross links of the stent that could record that brain activity. To do that, we had to do a complete overhaul of stent manufacturing. Then connect it to a cable. Which brings the information out of the brain, and do it all in a way that it can be delivered in the cath lab. This way, we can make BCI accessible not to the thousands of people, but to the millions of people who need this technology. Graham Felsted, an incredible human being suffering with ALS, became the first person in the world to receive and use one of these brain-computer interfaces. I was standing in the cath lab. Dr. Peter Mitchell had just completed the surgery. It just felt like we were witnessing something new in the world. I had tingles down my spine. I've got them now, thinking about it again. I turned to my colleague Pete and I said something poetic and profound, like, "Pete, holy shit!" <laughs>
And then two hours later, something even more amazing happened. Graham woke up, and he asked, "Am I alive?" And our nurse Christine broke out in tears of relief. It was it was a phenomenal moment. Once it's in place, it's connected to this tiny antenna that sits under the skin in the chest. This collects the raw brain data and sends it out of the body wirelessly to then connect with external devices. It's always on and ready to go, kind of like how your brain is meant to work. So here's how it works. Our engineers work with our patients to decode specific movements. So we tell the patient, "Press down your foot." So they'll repeatedly press down their foot, and we can. You now you won't see the foot moving because they're paralyzed, but we've been able to determine which brain signals are generally linked to "Press down your foot." Now we repeat this for several different types of movements. Say, "Open, close your hand," or "Pinch and grip your finger." Now that may not seem like much, but these become the building blocks. For every single interaction on a digital device that is needed for control, converted to click, up, down, left, right, menu, back, etc. But what's really amazing is that, to some degree, this process, our brain signals are universal. So the brain signal for press down your foot for me is the same as it is for you. Now this means that we're creating a dictionary of the brain across all humans. This is going to make BCI truly scalable. As Philip once said to me, it's kind of like learning how to ride a bike. It takes a bit of practice, but once you're rolling, it becomes natural. Now I just look on the screen where I want to click, and I'm texting, messaging the world via Twitter. But Graham, he said, as his ALS was progressing. That it gave him immense comfort to know that even if his body was failing, he was always going to be able to tell his wife that he loved her. In the future, I'm really excited about the breakthroughs BCI could deliver to other conditions like epilepsy, depression, and dementia. But beyond that, what is this going to mean for humanity?、And、what's really got me thinking is the future of communication. Take emotion. Have you ever considered how hard it is to express how you feel? You have to self-reflect, package the emotion into words, and then use the muscles of your mouth to speak those words. But you really just want someone to know how you feel. For some people with certain conditions, that's impossible. So what if, rather than using your words, you could throw your emotion, just for a few seconds? And have them really feel how you feel. At that moment, we would have realized that the necessary use of words to express our current state of being was always going to fall short. The full potential of the brain would then be unlocked. But for right now, BCI is about restoring the lives of millions of people with paralysis after years of feeling trapped. This technology promises the return of autonomy and independence, but what I really mean is dignity. Thank you. As Oxley put it, connection is a fundamental human need. Today, there are as many as 30,000 people living with ALS in the United States. With 5,000 new cases being diagnosed each year, nearly 800,000 Americans suffer from a stroke each year. That's one every 40 seconds, and 5.8 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Taken together, these populations represent just a small fraction of the total number of people whose ability to communicate, to connect. Has been compromised, and for whom an intervention like Oxley's could be game-changing. That's why I love this talk so much. It's a beautiful demonstration of the promise of technology, which, at its best, can offer real solutions to human problems. In this case, increasing access to one of the most fundamental needs of every person on the planet: connection. 
Now this technology might not work for my friend's Nana. Unlike diseases like locked-in syndrome, Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disorder that leads to decreased cognitive function, memory loss, and dementia. Even with a stench road that could allow her to text and tweet, it's unlikely that she would be able to communicate in that way. But as Oxley points out, through a wireless connection, something like the stench road could eventually allow us to throw our emotional realities into each other's brains instead of having to translate them into words. Like sending a text message, but even more direct. And while this functionality is still a ways away, maybe that would allow Nana to communicate with her loved ones again. We could know when she's feeling scared or sad, happy, even loved. I bet there's not a person alive who hasn't wished for a better way to share their feelings than words in the middle of an argument. Investing in fields like disability research is just that, an investment. Too often, this type of field gets written off as niche. But as we can see with the stench road, developments in one area of tech often have payoffs elsewhere as well. When the federal government pledged billions of dollars for Alzheimer's research funding starting several years ago, there was a lot of skepticism about whether that money could be better spent elsewhere. But as this talk demonstrates, you never know where the next big thing will come from. TED Tech is part of the TED Audio Collective and is produced by TED in partnership with Transmitter Media. Our editor is Sammy Case and the show is fact-checked by Christiane Aparta. I'm Sherelle Dorsey. Let's keep digging into the future. Join me next week for more.